Good afternoon, family and friends. What a beautiful day nonetheless. And together as we fellowship in God's word, may that beauty intensify within you as you're encouraged. You know, the Bible says that our faith comes by hearing God's word. And the days we're living in, we need greater faith than we've ever had. That the Lord may not say, oh, ye of little faith, but great faith. So let's get into God's word together. We're going to start in the gospel of Joel. Joel chapter 2, the Old Testament prophet spoke of the day we're living in, one of the great promises we have and we're all looking forward to preparing for is the latter rain outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Call it revival, awakening, stirring, and all the above. I look forward to and trusting that the situations we're looking at today in our government, in our education, uh, in our media, Absolutely, my friends, I believe the Lord's made it clear that there is no human ability to rectify the situations we're in. But with man, these things are not possible. But with God, all things are possible. Joel chapter 2, and I want to begin at verse 21, just read a couple of verses, ask you to mark your place. We may come back here before we're through, but I want to begin at verse 21. This is Joel chapter 2, verse 21. And God is speaking through him when he says to his people, Fear not. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, you beasts of the few, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit. The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. So be glad, verse 23 says, be glad then, you children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you that rain and the, the former rain and the latter rain in the last month. And then he says, the floor shall be full of wheat, the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. Why? Because the next verse says, I will restore to you the years. I will restore, God says, the years. I want to talk to you about that today. If the Lord put this in my spirit yesterday, actually a message that I had spent many hours preparing uh, will be for another time. Because in my spirit, I kept hearing these words. God's promise that in the day we're living in, after many years of the enemy eroding away and destroying and gnawing at the very foundation of our nation, of our church, and of our lives and families, that we've seen the enemy that he likens here unto locusts, unto caterpillars and gnawing uh, insects that have eaten away their crops. They have now had four years of famine. And God then says, but be of good cheer. Rejoice. He said that the fields are going to be full again. The vats will be full. The barns will be full. And it's all because, listen, he said, I will restore the years. I want to talk to you about what I call the lost years. Anyone who has lost anything, anyone who's gone through relationship difficulties, the loss of a job, but more importantly, I'm looking at the fact that this restoration God's talking about is something that goes back years. Something that in fact the restoration is going to be so grand and mighty because it's taken years for us to get to this place. I want you to think about our country. You know many look around today and they listen to the news, they see what's taking place and the easy thing to say is we're beyond hope. We've passed the line of revival and hope. Every day, new reports of things that continue to uh, crop up in our government that are mocking and totally going adverse to God's word, his principles, his people. And it's easy to say, you know, this, is, this has reached the point now where it's beyond hope and help. I remind you that we didn't get here yesterday, but the slow eroding and the deceitfulness of sin that crept in, and I think in my lifespan, I look back on the 60s when we had what was at the time and still now is called the uh, a, another cultural revolution. 
We had the drug revolution and the uh, promiscuity of the 60s that was personified by our Woodstock area, the hippies. And now we're going through another cycle that's even deeper and has even gone darker. And so it was during that 60 decade that we took prayer out of the schools, that we began to say that it's okay for us to kill a baby in the mother's womb. And we began to drift away, or a better way, as Joel says, it is the enemy was gnawing away at the very foundation of our country. But I'm going to ask you, can you believe with me that regardless of how dark it looks, how dark this has covered the earth and gross darkness people, but God said, I will restore the years. I call them the lost years. The church has lost years. Years ago, I remember when the Holy Spirit moved mightily almost in every service. And we saw what Jesus saw and said we should expect to see. And that is the gospel preached, not psychology. We had the power of God's word clearly hammered away from fiery pastors and prophets who were not afraid of people's opinion and cared less about being politically correct. And God confirmed that word. The pure preaching of the cross was confirmed with signs following. And we saw many healings, not just a few. We saw demons cast out and people filled with the Holy Spirit. Young people coming out of drugs and being set free from addictions and problems. All because we were preaching the truth in God's word. But as the pulpits went weak and silent, then we began to see that same weakness created in our society and weaken the very foundation of our government. But my friends, God's promise is he will restore those lost years. And how many of you in your own life, there's a situation that may have taken place. And this is where the burden of my heart came. I was recently talking with an individual who felt like because of traumatic incidents that took place many years back in their life, then they now felt that the ensuing problems that came from that, that made their life only worse and a bigger mess. And they felt like there's really no way to fix it. It's beyond repair now. This has gone on for, keywords too long. So I don't see there's any hope. My friends, I want you to get a hold of this today, that I don't care how long ago it was, that something that is so embarrassing, so hurtful, has caused you so much shame that you've allowed the enemy to tell you that there's no hope. And some of you, you've heard prophecies when you were young that God was going to use you, that God had great plans for your life. But then the enemy came in and sideswiped you. You were ambushed when you least expected it. And therefore, failure has marked your life and you feel like that all those years now have been lost. And you can even trace perhaps something, that one thing in your life that not only happened, but maybe continued to happen. It may be still happening now. And you feel like there's no hope. You hear people talk about a move of God coming, a great revival, and yet you feel like at best perhaps you would be one looking in, but not a participant with. Well, I want to stir your hearts today and encourage you that God is going to restore the lost years. Now, I want you to turn with me, if you would, to the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles. If we would have read on in the second chapter of Joel, we would have seen that God said, in this restoration, he said, I'm going to take away your shame. I want you to remember that. God's promise is he will restore everything, including he's going to take away, he's going to do some demo work on the shame that the enemies used to beat you down and convince you because you've lost too many years, there's little hope left. In Second Chronicles, I want to go to chapter 33. I just want to bring your attention to something that actually when the Holy Spirit spoke this into my heart, I really didn't see the connection, but I was obedient just to go and reread something I've read many times, but I didn't really see how it fit in what the Lord had put on my heart. But this is an account of one of the kings of Israel called Manasseh. There's a couple things that if you're taking notes, you need to take note about this king. Number one, 
he was, and I'll show you in scripture, the most evil king. Listen to what I'm saying now. He was the most evil king in the entire history of the children of Israel. Now that's saying a lot because they had their share. But this man certainly outdistanced all of them in the abominable things that he brought in. Now his previous predecessors had done quite a job successfully removing and bringing people back to righteousness, removing the altars of Baal and Ashtoreth and the pagan practices. But now here Manasseh has decided that that just is not too politically correct for today. Let's do like the rest of the world. And little by little, he began to introduce pagan practice into God's pure people. So much so, my friends, that the details are almost beyond comprehension. He murdered many, tortured multiple people, not only uh, in his kingdom, but in his own family. He reinstituted even baby sacrifice to Molech. All the worshiping of Baal that had been torn down now was reinstituted even with greater vigor as this king Manasseh spent years. Now, I want you to take note of something very unique. He was the long, not only the most evil king, Manasseh was also the one who served the longest. Actually, no king, including David, came even close to his term in office that God allowed. He served from the throne for 55 years. Now get this. For 40 of those 55 years, he was a scoundrel. He did everything and anything he could that went contrary to God and his word. He knew better and did it anyway. For how long? 40 years. Many of the kings never even reigned a total of 40 years. But he reigned for a total of 55. Now listen, the first 40 was absolutely a mess. And therefore the people of Israel suffered at the hands of their enemy. They went through droughts. They went through great persecution and difficulties. Why? Because they had an evil king who abandoned God's word and began to accumulate pagan practice for 40 of his 55 years of reign. And then, and we're gonna read that briefly here, at the end of 40 years, God then finally sends judgment to awaken him. And in fact, he not only is awakened by God, stirred by what he has to go through, repents of his 40 years of sin. And it says that God hears him, restores him, and he has another 15 years in office that God gives him with great victory as he walked in righteousness and led the kingdom back to God. Now, what do I want you to get from this? A couple of things. Number one, I want you to think about 55 years. If you really kind of break that down, almost two thirds of his ministry life, if you will, were a mess, totally beyond backslidden. And yet God turned him around forgave him, restored him, and the last 15 of his life, one third, if you will, he saw great victory. I also even see significance how this applies to you and I. Is it possible as numbers are important to God? 40 throughout the Bible is always a time of testing, a time of God testing you, preparing you. Often it looks like a wilderness going in circles as the children of Israel did for 40 years. 40 days, 40 nights tested inside of an ark with two of every kind of animal on the planet. Think about it. God always uses testing with the number 40. And so here Manasseh is tested for 40 years. And quite frankly, every year in those 40 years, he came up with a flunking grade. And yet then God at the end of 40 gives him 15 more years. There was another king who asked God for 15 more years and he gave it to him. Even when God said, you're going to die, get your house in order. And God heard him cry for 15 more years and he granted it. My friends, what I'm saying to you is the enemies lied to you that the lost years have ruined your life, have made it impossible for you now to receive and enter into the purposes and plans God has for you still today. Listen, if he can forgive Manasseh after 40 years of 
rebellion against God. When he finally turns his heart and repents from his rebellion, God restores the lost years. Listen to what it says about him here in 2 Chronicles chapter 33. We're getting towards the end of his life. And it says in verse 9, this is 2 Chronicles 33, 9, it says, So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen. Do you see that? This is God's king sitting on the throne to rule God's people and his sinful lifestyle, it says here, is worse than the heathen. And my friends, I believe as sad as this may sound, I say it with no pleasure, but I, I believe today the pulpits are heading in the same direction where we may be the very leaders of promiscuity and what is now acceptable all in the name of just let's love one another. Look at it again. Manasseh, he caused God's people to err and he did worse than the heathen whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Look at the next verse, verse 10. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. My friends, you know, God has been speaking to us now, especially in recent years. I believe that 9-11 was the voice of God to wake us up. I stood two weeks prior to those planes flying into those towers on top of the South Tower, and I knew in my spirit God's judgment was coming and that the protection we've known for over 200 years, the hands of God were dropping, and the enemies of our country for the first time were found on our shore finding success against us. And it says so that God spoke to them over and over, spoke to them through prophets, but they wouldn't listen. Verse 11, next verse. Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon. In short, what he's saying is after 40 years, God continually warning and speaking through prophets to Manasseh and he and the people didn't want to hear it. And so God said, all right, your defenses are going to be removed and the Assyrians are going to come. And they not only come, it says they find Manasseh hide, hiding in a briar patch and they take him and they put him in fetters or chains and he is now captive to the Assyrians. And watch how quickly things turn around now. The next verse, verse 12 says, and when he, he, Manasseh, was in his affliction, in other words, now after 40 years of God continuing to forgive, to show mercy and to bless him and the children of Israel, now he's in affliction. Now he's captive to the Assyrians. But it says he besought the Lord, his God, and he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And the next verse says he prayed unto him, God, and he was entreated of him or God. God hears his prayer. It says, and God hears his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem. His captivity, his affliction was ended. Then Manasseh, it says, knew that the Lord, he was God. Now, you know what strikes me the most about this? When you do the research and realize that this man has sat on the throne for 40 years, he's rebelled against God. For 40 years, he's heard God's warnings. And yet he rejected him and said, we're going to go the world's way. And finally, now he's a captive himself, bound by the Assyrians. And the Bible says in the very next verse, after 40 years of mocking God, suddenly he turns to God. It says he cries out, humbles himself greatly. But all in one verse, it not only says he repents, but it says God hears him and restores him in one verse. In one verse, God can reverse 40 years of failure, the lost years. Had we been there, we would have probably been astounded. How in the world, God, can you just let 40 years go? I mean, this man really needs to pay a greater price. Certainly, he needs to go into quarantine for a few years. Somebody needs to watch this guy, counsel this guy, Maybe punish this guy because after 40 years to think simply now that you're hurting, that you can cry out to God and he will forgive you and restore you, it's in your Bible. That's the God we serve. 
And not only that, allowed the most wicked king of Israel to sit on the throne the longest and gave him 15 more years and saw the kingdom restored and returned, awakened and revived to serve God. Or in other words, God restored to them the lost years. Now I want to take you to the New Testament now and show you an example in Luke chapter 6. A powerful picture that we find in one of the miracles of Jesus, Luke chapter 6. Not only a powerful picture, but I believe a prophetic promise to those of you today that can receive a rhema word that God's going to do the same thing that he can and wants to restore your lost years. Luke chapter 6. I'm thinking as we turn there, we're going to begin here in verse 6 of the same chapter in just a moment. But I want you to listen as well. The thought comes to me how that we find when the children of Israel, after returning from 70 years of captivity in Babylon, they return to Jerusalem only to find the rubble and the ruins of the captivity when they were first captured. The temple was destroyed. It now lays in and broken stones and dust. And when the people come back, at first they're encouraged. They're rejoicing that they no longer are slaves in Babylon. And so when they come back now, they look at this devastation, the devastation of years. You say, but brother, it didn't take years for Babylon to destroy Jerusalem. No, but listen, it took years of sin and rejecting God for them to get in the situation where suddenly... God had to send judgment. We're always shocked at the suddenly of whether it's a pandemic or whether it's a, a hurricane or earthquake or fires. And yet it's not suddenly. It's at the end of many years usually of God's great mercy. And finally, at some point, his love and mercy doesn't end. It's just that mercy understands that any further allowing this to continue would not be mercy at all. It would be the greatest failure of God to not awaken us to the fact we're on the wrong path, producing the wrong results and wondering why that we're suffering as we are, as a nation, as a church, and as individuals in our families. Because we've lost too many years where we sat back or slept through as we watched the enemy as caterpillars and locusts eating little by little at the foundation of our lives. Now that's where we found our, the Israel finds himself back from Babylon now in Jerusalem. You can find this in Zechariah chapter four. And when Zerubbabel, who is the captain of this group that's gone back to rebuild the temple, the people look at the pile of broken stones and they lose hope and heart. They're looking at the ruin that was has laid there for 70 years. For 70 years, they've lost sacrificing to God as he commanded. For 70 years, they've not known the blessing of their own land. For 70 lost years, they lived as slaves in Babylon. But now, God keeps his word. 70 years are up and it's time for restoration. Somebody say amen. <laughs> it's time to see those years that they lost restored. However, as they stand and look at this devastated temple in all of Jerusalem, it seemed impossible. And there we get the promise that's often quoted when God says to the prophet, he says, listen, this is not going to be done by strength, your strength and your power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And the joy of the Lord will be your strength. And so as they're staring at this reminder of the lost years, his piles of broken stones. God tells him through the prophet, he says, look at it and realize you can't do this in your ability, but instead shout at it, grace, grace. Grace means God's ability. Or in other words, what he was saying, yes, you caused this mess. Yes, there have been lost years. But let me tell you something. The only way you're going to see those years restored is you're going to be have to finally realize that your strength's not enough. Your ability won't get this done. Don't shout at it, we'll try. 
Don't shout at it, Will, if I can just get to the right man of God and the right tent meeting or the right service where God's moving. Listen, the only way your life can see the restoration of lost years is you've got to look at that situation no matter what you did, how long ago it was, how often you've done it, and how horrible it seemed. Still look at it, see the ruins it's caused, and shout at it, grace, grace. Not what I can do, but what only God can do. Grace, grace, for it's not by my strength, but it's by his spirit, saith the Lord. Recently I heard, listened to a testimony of a woman who shared details that I won't about how problems in her life that she could never get rid of would cause her to have periods of some peace, periods of time where she walked in deliverance, only to find herself falling back into the same trap the enemy had set for her since she had been a young girl. And the enemy now had convinced her as she looked back in the rearview mirror of her journey with the Lord, and she thought, all I've ever been is a failure. Every time I tried, it failed again. I'm tired of trying. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. Quote, unquote, I give up. And she said one day when she was on the border of suicide, she found herself just crying out to God, God, my life is a mess. It has been a mess. I've missed so many years of peace and not walking with you. Lord, if you can take my life and do anything with it, you can have it because I'm through, I'm done. I have nothing else. And God spoke to her heart almost immediately. And she heard the Lord deep within her spirit say, I will restore those years. Listen to me now. God spoke clearly to her heart and said, I will, I can and I will restore all those years that the enemy stole. And she said, suddenly, new faith rose up inside of her. But she said, and then I heard the Lord say something that was a bit strange. I heard him say, I will restore those years. But then the next thing he said to me was a question. He said, why did it take so long for you to bring it to me? Why did you take so long to bring it to me? And she said, my first thought was, I don't understand, Lord. I've brought this to you many times. How many times I've ended up in a mess and the, these same crazy decisions that I said I'd never do again, and I did. How many times, Lord, I cried out to you? What do you mean? Why did I take so long to bring it to you? And then suddenly the Lord began to open it up to her. He said, yes, you brought your problems to me. You brought the mess that often you would make again and again. Yes, you brought to me the painful circumstances and the problems you were going through. But why did it take so long for you to just bring me your life? Give me your will. Why did it take so long for you to figure out that I never intended you to run your own life? Those who run their own life ruin their own life. Why did it take so long for you to bring it to me? But now that you brought it, it what? Not it the problem, bring it your heart to me. And before the clouds gather and the next storm comes and your failure seems inevitable, say, Lord, today, this is the day you made. I'm not only gonna rejoice in it, I've learned the hard way that I'm gonna walk with you in it or I will bring more ruin and they only add to the lost years. He can, he will, and wants to restore the lost years. Let's look at that in this picture here in Luke chapter 6 as we close. In Luke chapter 6, I want to begin in verse 6. We find Jesus headed for synagogue, for a church service, like many of you did today. I hope your experience is not similar to what took place. It says in verse 6, And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he, Jesus, entered into the synagogue, and he taught. And he says in there, there was a man who's noticed, he even gives us specifics. It says his right hand, everyone say right hand. His right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him. They watched Jesus, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day. Why? So that they might 
find an accusation against him. Accuser of the brethren working right here in the middle of church. Verse 8, but he knew their thoughts. Jesus knew their thoughts. And he said to the man, this is the man with the withered hand. Now watch this now. He said to the man which had the withered hand, rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Let's stop. Look at me. You know what's happening here? Jesus goes into a service. He takes over. Thank God. I remember those days when Jesus would take over a service. I long for him again. And Jesus sees the man with a withered hand. And he says to him, you, stand up. You've seen that happen in service more than once. You, you, stand up. No, no, you, you. You with the brown coat on. Stand up. And it says he arose. Now let's watch this now. Watch. The next verse. And then verse 9, Jesus said unto them, to the rest of them. He's got the man standing up with a withered hand. And he says to the rest of this religious group who's trying to catch Jesus doing something not politically correct. Probably doesn't have his mask on. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll ask him one day. And then he turns to this religious crowd and he says, I want to ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? And then I love what the next verse it says. And then he's looking around about them all. Get the picture now. Look at me. Jesus walks in. He doesn't care what kind of little religious service they're having. He sees a man who's got a withered hand. And he also can read the thoughts of the rest of these religious people. You guys want me to go over there and heal them so you can accuse me of breaking your Sabbath day. So I'm going to ask you a question. Y'all having church in here. A lot of my paraphrase. Y'all having church in here. Is it better to heal somebody or do you just go on ahead and it says destroy? Better to give life or destroy now, why would he say to them, destroy? Because what I'm going to show you in a minute is this man had become comfortable going to church week after week, even though he had a withered problem in his life and nothing changed going to that church. And so Jesus asked him, saying, listen, y'all want to continue having your dead service? Or would you like to see this man finally set free? They didn't have much to say. And he's looking around at him. Y'all got anything to say? They didn't have a word to say. Read on. And then he says... After he looks around, verse 10, he said to the man, stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole, notice this, as the other, just like the other hand. Now let's break this down. If you're taking notes, I want you to, I'm going to give you just some quick points here that the Lord put on my heart. Number one, the man with the withered hand. What's a withered hand? This is key to everything that the Lord put on my heart yesterday morning. A withered hand is a part of the body that stopped growing when the rest continued. Well, wait a while, let that depth charge kick into your spirit. A withered part of this man's body means this is part of his body, his right hand, that even though the rest, including the other hand, grew properly, matured, strengthened, was trained, this hand never grew properly, was stunted in his growth. And not only that, those who would have had anything that was withering in a limb would have done their best to hide it because it was considered in their culture a sign of weakness to have a crippled limb, to as Jacob who had to limp after he finally surrendered to God, he couldn't get away from the limp of his failures. And so this man would have, in his withered hand, been ashamed because many would have considered the fact that either he had great sin in his life or his family did. Either way, that withered hand, watch now, he would have had to have kept it under his robe. He would have had to have hidden it. Hidden what? Hidden one part in his life that didn't mature even though the rest was blessed. You know, there are many today with withered hands where most of their life is blessed. In fact, the part we get to see looks like it's all blessed. It's the part that's hiding. It's the part that's withered that hasn't grown. And do you know that they've even proven scientifically that there is psychologically a stunting of growth that when a, a young person goes through a traumatic experience, of which all sin is. Perhaps it makes a horrible failure. 
I've seen this happen with young women who are pregnant out of wedlock and they sometimes felt like there was no other choice but to have an abortion. And yet that, that seems to disfigure or that part of their life, they hide that withered hand even though it still torments them. And they look back since the day that it happened and they see those as lost years, things that can't be regained. Now listen carefully. Number one, the withered hand is a part of your life that hasn't grown. They found out that people with addictions, listen, psychologists have found this. It's just a matter of statistic truth that when someone has had that kind of trauma in their life early on, that it can create an addictive lifestyle. And once that lifestyle of addiction, listen, once it starts, there is a stunting of growth in an area of their life that doesn't continue to grow. While other parts of their life go on and seem to mature and successfully progress, but there's this one area that seems to stay infantile, immature, not seemingly part of the character that I know of that person. Now, we all know what I'm talking about. I can't believe they did that. that that's just so unlike them. I have a hard time believing that. Why? Because we see the maturity in the rest of their lives, perhaps even great giftedness, but an area of character in their life never continued to grow. And it's still very vulnerable to act like a child at that age, even though now they've reached older years in life. They find themselves acting like a child. My friends, I believe today we're gonna to see a moment that Paul came to in his life when he said at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, he said, I've finally come to a place where I've put away childish things. I'm no longer going to be held back and held down by the lost years of an area of my life that is withered. So number one, there can be that one withered thing, that one part that didn't grow. But number two, that one part can affect every part of your life. Satan knows what he's doing. If he can just cause you to have one grand failure, even if it was many years ago, then he will label you and tell you that you're a failure. And then that one area of weakness and immaturity in your life will begin to affect every other part of your life. This man we know from extra biblical sources like Josephus that he was a stonemason. Now think about it. Not only was he a stonemason, did you notice that Brother Luke, who was a physician, would have been more into details. He tells us it was the man's right hand that was withered. In those days, a right hand was considered your strength. If you were left-handed, they would do everything they could. Mom would tie up your left hand and make you use your right hand because it was considered the hand of strength and ability. And yet this man, something happened. And when we look at the word withered, theologians argue, was it genetic or was there an injury? Either way, many injuries come from genetics. I truly believe when Joel said that God would restore the years, and he goes on to name four levels of a demonic attack. And I believe that represents four generations. God talked about the sins of one generation passed on to four generations and I believe many people today are under the curse and control of things that happened four generations back in their family and they don't even know it. But somebody had a crippled hand and it was passed on spiritually, genetically as something that affected even the next couple generations. But God still says, I'll restore the lost years. And so here we have one withered hand that affects every other part, one part that affects every part. Think about the stonemason. Without a strong right hand, you can't lay block and stone. And so this one part of weakness in his life would have affected every part of his life. He couldn't have, keep a job, couldn't make a living, may have very well been homeless and as a lot would find their way to the synagogue and hope maybe he'd get a meal after the service. So this one area in his life, one withered part affected every part of his life. You know what I'm talking about. How Satan can bring 
that immature area of your life can bring attack against it and you find yourself falling into that same weakness that has affected every part of your life for many years. And God's saying it's time. It's time for restoration of the lost years. Number one, what's that one part that's withered in your life? Number two, have you recognized that one part is important? You've let the devil say, well, it'll, I've got everything else together. It's that one part. Well, I'm not worried about that one part. Well, you should. The one part affects every part of your life. But number three, write it down. That one part does not define the rest of the parts. Oh, the devil will tell you it does. He'll tell you because that one hand may be crippled or challenged, then you are a cripple. And to God, you're nothing but a challenge. And that you fail that challenge over and over again. But the one part doesn't define who you are. You know, I found it interesting that oftentimes that you can bring up one person's name and it immediately, without sometimes even telling you the last name, all you will ever think about is their failure. Let me prove that to you. I'm going to say one name. I challenge you to grab the first thought in your mind. Jimmy Swagger. I rest my case. I promise you, most of you didn't remember decades upon decades of great sacrifice that probably reached more people for Christ than anyone else, perhaps than Billy Graham. But we think of one thing that hit the news, one area where there was perhaps something withered since childhood, even in his life. And yet we discount everything else and we define them by that one part. Now, the one part doesn't define who you are. Number one, we have the one withered part, and then the one part affects every part, but that one part doesn't define who you are. Number four, you're going to have to recognize that you've got perhaps a crippled hand because you're in a place where they don't help you with crippled hands. <laughs> this boy has been going to church here for a long time, hiding his crippled hand. And isn't it interesting when Jesus shows up, the first thing he does, he gets a word of knowledge and he says, you, stand up, stand up. You, stand up. And then he tells him to stretch forth his hand. Or another way of saying it, because I've heard preachers say this way, stretch forth your hand. I don't think he said that. Remember, the man's hiding his hand. Only Jesus knows it's, it's withered. The rest of the folks are just happy. Enough. And if they'd ever pulled it out, they would probably said, stick that thing back in. You can't be a deacon with a withered hand, so cover it up. Unless people find out about my withered hand. Keep it hidden. <laughs> you know, I wrote this in my notes because I, I think it's sadly so true. We've got too many places today that will help you maintain. They'll help you maintain and be comfortably crippled. I know you didn't like that, but I'm going to say it again. There's too many places today that you can go in and get out, usually in 45 minutes max, and you will leave comfortably crippled. You can go in with a withered hand, hide it well, and leave with the same withered hand. That's what this man had been doing for who knows how long. But he comes to church one day, and Jesus shows up. Oh, give us more of those days. And Jesus says, you, stand up. And then he rebukes the rest of the crowd, that religious spirit that had kept him comfortably crippled, and he says to him, stretch forth your hand. You know what he was saying? Stop hiding what you're ashamed of. I wish I had a witness here. <laughs> Stop hiding what you're ashamed of. God knows it's there. And you've spent too much time and energy worrying about what are the, whether anybody else can see it. Bring it out into light. Jesus said, bring that, bring that crippled hand out. Bring that hand out, that one part of your life. Because I, if I can heal that one part, the rest is going to work. It's affected your every other part. And yet that one part doesn't define who you are. So don't hide it in shame. Bring it out. Stretch it out to me. Stretch it out to me. And can you see that man who's been standing up through this whole thing? But I want to make a point to you that oftentimes we may miss. Almost every other miracle that I've read about Jesus healing, delivering, the person always asks for help. Oh, I don't think you got this now. Come on. 
It's the woman who comes crawling and touches the hem of his garment. It's the blind man who cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Even the thirsty woman at the well asked for water. This man was hiding. This man sat in the crowd and nobody recognized that he had a hidden area that was crippled. Jesus did. And the man didn't ask Jesus for deliverance. Jesus came to him. Jesus found him. You see, I say that because as I'm closing, many of you are saying, oh, Brother Wes, I've got a son, I've got a daughter, I've got a husband, I've got a friend. And they're comfortably crippled. They limp in and out of church week after week, only comfortable in their crippled condition that is well hidden from most. And yet they'll never stretch out their hand, Brother West. They're working too hard on hiding it. Brother West, I don't think they'd ever desire even to stretch forth their hand. My friends, I've come with a word for you. And it comes right out of the last chapter of the last book of this Bible as I close. Jesus said in the last five verses, he said, it's about over. He said, I sent my angel to testify of everything I've written in this book called your Bible. And then he says, now, listen, let the spirit and the bride say, come. Let the Holy Spirit and the bride, who's the bride? The church. And do you realize that that's a promise, an end time promise, I believe where God is saying, listen, even for those like the man with the withered hand, he didn't cry out to me, but I came and found him anyway. All the others cried out for help. This man couldn't. And yet Jesus saw where he was and he said, don't hide anymore, stretch out your hand. Stretch out your hand. Let the spirit and the bride today say, come. Listen, as we close, we're going to have a word of prayer because I feel in my spirit that some of you are saying, if my son, my, my loved one, if they would only stretch forth their hand, do you realize you as the bride of Christ, part of that bride, the church, can join your voice with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let the spirit and the bride say, come. Listen, whoever that person is, I want you to focus on them right now. Put them, their face, their name, their need in your heart right now. There's somebody that's believing for a Billy. There's somebody that's believing for a Janet or Janice. And you still love and you pray occasionally, but God is saying today it's time to make a declaration. Let the spirit and the bride say to that person who's running from God, I don't care whether they're in the north, the south, the east, or the west. Let the spirit and the bride say it's time, come and stretch forth your hand. Just say their own name right now. I don't care who's there with you. Just say their name. Billy, stretch forth your hand. In Jesus' name, I bind every spirit that's blinded you, crippled you, and lied to you that you cannot see restoration. There's been too many lost years. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we don't understand. We just take your word and we will obey your command. You said, let the spirit and the bride of Christ say come. And we say come from the north, come from the south, come from the east and the west. Come shake yourself from the dust of this world. Loosen yourself from the bands of wickedness and walk in the purposes and plans God has had for your life since your mother's womb. Father, I declare that for each person under the sound of my voice, that no matter what it is they've done, how long they've stumbled in, and Father, you'll let them know you're the God of restoration. You said it, we believe it. You will restore the years. Thank you, Father. Restore the years, we pray in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord, even the lost years. God bless you. Believe that. Take that and receive that in Jesus' name. We love you. God bless.